without further ado, I was, all of us remember that we had Ashok Beatty speak with us back in the middle of April. And we spoke to him because, or no, it was the 30th of April that we spoke to him. And because of that conversation and the mention of the Gita and the mention of Vishnu returning in that conversation to myself, I said, oh my God, I should go back and learn something about the Gita since, since this very experienced Jungian psychologist had mentioned it. And I didn't quite know where he had gotten the text. He, he referred to a text, but I wanted to see, you know, what the Gita was all about. And so when I did that, when I went back, uh, I realized that a lot of things had been going on in my life for uh, since I was a senior in college. And, and some examples of that are that when I was a senior in college, I wrote a paper comparing Mao's little red book to Confucian thought. And so I had a book on Confucianism and I had Mao's little red book and I wrote them up side by side and oh my God, basically they were the same thing. And I had some confirmation at that time. I had a professor who I've talked about here who was one of my key mentors, Edwin Lee. And Professor Lee gave me an A plus on that paper, which was like my senior thesis. So I was very pleased about that. And so leaving that aside, I had been trying to get back to Japan for many years. And in 1982 or three, when I got my first computer, I decided to write a translation of Sun Tzu's Art of War in business words. Now, keeping in mind, that at that time, 83, I was still under 40. I was a major in the Marine Corps Reserve. I was very much into the logos. I was leading a company in Tokyo. And I was very interested in the fact that the Japanese, all Japanese businessmen had read Sun Tzu. And I said, oh my God, well, if they've all read Sun Tzu, I think I better read it too. And so what I did was I took Sun Tzu uh, verse by verse, basically, and put it in terms of business English strategies and tactics as any freshly min minted MBA would have done, which is what I was at the time. I was straight out of my business school experience. I had practiced law for five years before that, or dur during the time I was going to business school, uh, part of that, part of my law practice was when I was going to business school. And then I found myself in Tokyo. So I decided to do this translation. I would say about five years ago now, and, and mind you, I've been studying Jungian psychology for 33 years. And so I'm well aware that Dr. Jung only did things when the self, his self, told him he needed to do it. And so there are many examples of that through his career. Uh, but the most noteworthy is his book entitled Answer to Job. He wrote that book in, I guess it was published in 1956. And, you know, meanwhile, other things that happened to make me interested in, in that process with Dr. Young. About five years ago, I got interested in this lecture by Edward Edinger entitled Experiences with the Greater Personality. And in that lecture, he talked about uh, four different experiences, actually five. He mentions a fifth one, which is in the Quran, 
which is in Shura 18 of the Quran, uh, where Mo Moses has uh, experience with uh, al Kidder. So anyway, I had read Dr. Edinger's description of uh, the engagement between Arjuna and Krishna at that time, but I had misinterpreted what he said. It, he gave a quite a detailed explanation in his lecture, and I interpreted what he said to mean that there was, you know, one passage in the Bhagavad Gita that had this numinous event that occurred to um, Arjuna, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I, I did not get at that time that that encounter is the entire Bhagavad Gita. I had no idea of that. I knew that that numinous experience had happened and had been described in the Gita in mid-April, uh, April 19th to be precise, we, we took Kushbu's story and Kushbu told me this morning that she has, uh, she's been following my work on on the YouTube channel for about a year, uh, and she never saw the need to connect up with me, even though she knew she had my uh, email address. But then when we started this global coronavirus check-in that we've been doing, she was very atta attracted to it, and she was especially attracted to the persona of uh, Tim Holmes, who's my partner in this venture, our partner in the Lucens. We've never physically met, and we come from opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, me from the Logos and Tim from the Eros, since he's a world-renowned artist. He's the first artist to have a solo exhibition at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, and that occurred in 1993. So he's been a, a world renowned artist for way, way back, okay, for over 30 years. So Tim and I had interacted many times, and he had been a part of my Jungian advanced reading group for quite a while. And he had a numinous experience between the 6th and the 9th of March. And he brought it into the advanced reading group on the following Wednesday. And we heard about it totally raw, right directly from the, from the experience, less than a week after, half a week after. Later, he agreed to talk about it publicly. So uh, last week he talked about it publicly. And from his experience, his experiences uh, as a youth, he was in a family that had six generations of Methodist ministers behind them. And what was shaken loose within Tim uh, immediately after his numinous experience was he wanted to write down his 95 theses, his manifesto of his life compared to uh, Martin Luther side by side. And so he did that over a month or so. And then a week ago yesterday, so eight days ago, he presented them for the first time and then last night we had a second session with Tim. So over the last three weeks, we've had Tim describe his numinous experience in detail. Uh, and then last week he presented the 95 Theses very quickly. And last night we were intending to do the side-by-side -side comparison. And we, uh, we did that, uh, however, I had thought we were going to talk about the exact comparison of the two, but Tim had some other ideas. So we started with that and, and uh, we talked for three hours and the people that participated enjoyed it very much. But Tim came out of that experience and he wanted a place where someone who'd had a numinous experience could be 
in a group of elders who have had experiences themselves and to help um, put a container around something that's exploding in, in one's mind. And um, I've certainly had many such experiences, including um, one eight month possession by my anima, which emerged as a novel. So I, I'm very familiar with these experiences. And so all of a sudden, these experiences started to emerge around uh, the Gita. And so Dr. Beatty had, uh, let's see, Dr. Beatty had mentioned this quote from the Bhagavad Gita. I'll just read it here. He said, whenever there's a decline in the law and an increase in iniquity, then I put forth myself for the reform of the pious and for the destruction of the evildoers, for the establishment of the law, I am born in every age. That spurred a discussion about what Dr. Jung had said about the Bhagavad Gita. So he said to me just casually, oh, well, you know uh, that he mentioned the Gita in the Red Book. And I had really remembered seeing that when I read the Red Book, and of course I have my own copy, but what I didn't know is where he had put it. I knew it was there. So the other day I wanted to, to find it so that I knew where it was in the, in the Red Book and to see if it had any meaning to me. And lo and behold, here's the quote. And I just opened the Red Book to that page the other day. And the significance of that, I mean, of course, it's anytime I open a book and I turn to the page that's significant, I treat that as numinous. Among other things that were happening to me was that I opened the book and this is the page I opened to. And this is where he's put it. And as you see, the Red Book is written entirely in German calligraphy by Dr. Jung himself. And only in this particular case, I can't think of another, but maybe there are a couple of others, he's written in English next to his image of Philemon. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita says, and then he repeats the, the same quote from the Gita that uh, Ashok mentioned to us. And so again, whenever there is a decline in the law and an increase in iniquity, then I put my, forth myself for the reform of the pious and for the destruction of the evildoers. For the establishment of law, I am born in every age. And he, he said many times there were things that he felt he could not say. So Dr. Jung was also the son of many, son and heir to many um, Swiss Reformed pastors going back uh, to the time of Goethe and earlier. And um, during his lifetime, his father was a Swiss Reformed pastor and seven of his uncles were Swiss Reformed pastors. So he was steeped in the the Protestant religion or Protestant approach to religion, and um, you could call it the family business. And so he made the comment at one point that there were things that he felt he could not say, uh, but he left hints for others to see. And so right here, what we're seeing is a giant hint from Dr. Jung because he's putting this critical quotation from the Gita exactly next to uh, his image of uh, Philemon, who from Dr. Jung's point of view would have been the equivalent of Krishna uh, for um, Arjuna. 
Uh, and of course, during the Red Book period, which lasted five years, and it, Dr. Jung worked on this book for 16 years, but uh, during the Red Book period, he had many active imaginations, what he called active imaginations from the psychological perspective uh, with Philemon in his unconscious. And this is his painting of Philemon as he saw him. Um, and so uh, I, call, I call that in terms of now my experience with the Gita and now uh, seeing that this is where he put this in the book and knowing that, that he was thinking about leaving hints. This is uh, for someone like me that's looking at it now from the point of view of the, of the Bhagavad Gita, it, for me it's a sledgehammer. It's not even a hint anymore. It's uh, very definitely what he was talking about. And, um, you know, for what it's worth, you know, I don't know. But in any case, on May 9th, I received my copy of the Bhagavad Gita because after our conversation with Ashok, I said, well, I guess I better go look at what the Gita has to say. And so I ordered two copies just to be safe. There are over 1,100 translations of the Gita, and they're in 75 languages. So looking at Amazon, no one can know which one is the important one. But we had been getting to know uh, Kushbu more and more over uh, a period of a, of a couple of weeks because of Tim's experience. And she's been sharing with us a Sanskrit mantra at the end of our sessions, which has been very meaningful to me also. And, uh, and it's become a kind of tradition in these sessions uh, to have that mantra. Now I was uh, talking to Kushbu earlier today, and she was in candlelight because she had lost power in Bangalore. So uh, I'm sure she uh, and she used quite a bit of her power talking to me earlier today. So um, the fact that she's not here shouldn't be regarded as strange because, in fact, um, in fact, she just doesn't have the power to do it probably this evening her time. When I got the Penguin edition, I opened it, and what I turned to, just again by synchronicity, was Discourse 10, verse 19. And at that point in the Gita, Krishna is giving a, a full account, or I don't know if it's a full account, but an account of who he is. And I read through that from verse 19 to the end of the Gita, or to the end of Discourse 10. And I said, oh my God, this is, this is uh, a description of the self in Jungian psychology precisely. And I said, wow, that's interesting. And so that made me want to think about going back and reading the Gita to find out how much more of it corresponds to Jungian psychology and what I've been doing for the last however many years, depending on where you want to count from. And so I thought to myself, geez, let, maybe I should get Kushbu to read it with me and to read the Sanskrit and I'll read the English. So on Mother's Day, which was May 10th, uh, I called Kushbu up and I said, you know, would you like to read the Bhagavad Gita with me? And she was very excited because it was Mother's Day. And as she had told her in her story, as she had told us in her story, her mother had committed suicide when Kushbu was nine years old. And Kushbu had been the one that found her mother dead. And uh, obviously that was a huge trauma. And we talk a lot about trauma in Jungian psychology and how 
when a trauma occurs, it's very common for a, an angel or for some numinous experience to occur. So there's a very famous Rembrandt drawing of Jesus in Gethsemane when he's visited by the angel. And meanwhile, Tim had completed a drawing of the rescuing angel, a rescuing angel separate from, separate from that, but he was probably aware of it. But the angel came to Jesus and offered the necessary consolation so that Christ could fulfill the calling of his self and go to the cross on the next day after the night in Gethsemane and after the Last Supper. We've been using that uh, image that Tim drew years ago for a logo for the, our activity here. And so that had been a very traumatic thing for Pushbu. And on Mother's Day, she had been thinking quite a lot about her mother. And her mother's name was Gita. So when I called her up and said, Kushbu, would you like to read the Bhagavad Gita with me? She couldn't say no. It was a numinous event for her as well. On May 11th of this year, she and I began to read. And every day, but today, since then, uh, we've been reading verses of the Gita. Unfortunately, we were unable to do so uh, yet this morning, today, because she didn't have power. And so she was just in candlelight talking to me on her cell phone, but her house was pitch dark and she didn't have access to her, the online version of the Gita that she's been reading from. And so if she gets power back, we'll still do it today. But uh, I suspect that she just is out of power at the moment. But anyway, we're, we're going forward with it. And uh, for both of us, we have considered what we're doing as a, a sacred activity and nothing other than that. Anyway, then on May 14th, okay, so now we're, now I'm talking about what happened with Les. Les Morgan happened to be in a conference that I attended that has been organized by a Indian American gen gentleman in New York named Srikant. And so we were both in that conference and Les identified himself as someone who knew something about the Bhagavad Gita, which made me very excited because I was three days or so, four days into, into our reading. And Les says, well, I've written these books and the study guide to the Bhagavad Gita and so on. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He was kind enough to give me his email address. And, and meanwhile, as soon as I went out of that conference, which was quite late here, I immediately went on to Amazon and ordered Les's two books. A couple of things happened with that. I read Les's introduction to both books and Les stated that he had downloaded, he stated in a footnote that he had downloaded the version of the Mahabharata that he was using on October 5th, uh, 2005. And for scholarly reasons, he had mentioned the date, he told me this afternoon that he had mentioned the date because that was uh, simply a, a stake in the sand. This is the, this is the version of the Mahabharata I'm using. And so if there have been updates after that period, they, he was not aware of them when he was doing his translation work. So he was making that scholarly observation. But of course, for me, 
that happens to be my birthday. And so that date popped out. And this is a sort of a, a numinous thing that happens to people. Uh, yesterday I was hearing, uh, you probably heard about the New York Times carrying a full page of a thousand names of people that had uh, died from the coronavirus. And one of the families of one of the men who has died mentioned that, you know, when they looked at the paper, there was no doubt in their mind that their loved one would be included. And as soon as they looked at it, this list of a thousand people, they, they saw his name instantly. And so that's the sort of the whack on the side of the head from numinosity that comes. And that's how Les's comment of my birthday, and also that happens to be roughly the same time when I started to read Carl Jung's collected works in, in other words, before that time, I had mainly been, been reading about Carl Jung and about his writings, but not reading him directly. I read a lot of Jungian analyst's work. I had had an archetypal possession that occurred in 1993 uh, because of a book by Clarissa Pincola Estes, who's a famous Jungian a analyst called Women Who Run With the Wolves. And I had had, um, right about that time, let's see, six months before that, I had, had, a, I had run into Jean Shinoda Bolin, who had written two books, Gods in Every Man and Goddesses in Every Woman. It happened that I had been doing some painting at that time, and I had an exhibition locally here in Annapolis, and I had invited the Union Analyst community to my exhibition. And they said, oh, well, Jean Shinoda Bolin is going to be here over that weekend, and is it okay if we bring her? <laughs> I said, sure, <laughs> you know, please bring her. <laughs> and, and so Jean Shinoda Bolin came to my exhibition. But at that point, I, I had read their works, and it had had various effects on my life, but I had not really started to read the collected works. And the reason for that was that I had always assumed that Dr. Jung's work was about clinical psychology. And what I discovered is that's not true at all. <laughs> it wasn't about it's not about clinical psychology. It's really about religion and culture. And this is why he was very reluctant in 1948 to start the C.G. Young Institute in Zurich. And he famously quipped, thank God I'm young, so I don't have to be a Jungian. <laughs> and, and of course, he was, he was a psychiatrist, so he had been practicing psychiatry, psychology uh, for decades, right? But he was reluctant to have a school of psychology founded around his collected works. But nonetheless, it was meant to be, I guess. And But I had always been critical of sort of critical of Jung and critical of the Jungian community because Jung really didn't do much about the collective during the, between World War I, between the beginning of the Red Book period until 1946, Dr. Jung really didn't say anything about the collective. Or he did, but he said it to a very small group of people. I mean, he Typically, he had a lecture group, and he would have 10 or 15 people, and these were people who later became famous Jungian analysts, but those people basically hid all of his work that related to religion, okay? And Jung did himself, I'm convinced of that, because I think he didn't 
he was protecting the fledgling psychotherapeutic industry or business, the profession, which he considered fledgling. And of course he was, he was there and one of the fledglings in the generation after Freud. Freud was one of the first movers, but Jung for a time as his crown prince, let's say, was right there at the master's knee and and then he vastly expanded beyond his master because freud was freud was a neurologist he wasn't a psychiatrist and so he was not familiar with psychosis per se and what can happen whereas Jung had been working at the Burgoldsley Mental Institution in Zurich for many years. He'd lived there for nearly 10 years at, with his wife and he's very familiar in a real up, up to your elbows way with psychiatry and psychology. And so he had learned a lot of the basic tenets of psychiatry as it's currently practiced, I think, up close and personal at the at the Burgosley. Meanwhile, over the last few days, Kushbu and I have continued to do our reading. And basically what I hear because of my experience with with Jung's collected works and the Red Book, which didn't come out until 2009, what I hear in the Gita is basically basically Jungian psychology, plain vanilla. Of course, unlike Les, I don't speak Sanskrit. I don't know anything about Hinduism per se. I'm at sea with with the Gita, but I have a lot of experience with India and with the East. So I've been around Buddhism for quite a while, since the 90s at least, and I lived next to the great Buddha of Kamakura for three years when I was in high school. So I had a lot of Buddhist background, but none in Hinduism per se, except that I did take a course in Oriental religions or something like that in my senior year of college. So I probably did get introduced to some part of the Gita at that time. But then I have, then by then I had Les's book, The Study Guide to the Bhagavad Gita. And Les has very kindly for scholars about the study uh, about the Gita, he has provided a theme guide. And so I haven't even read the whole book, the whole of the Bhagavad Gita yet, but I decided I would read the theme guide. And as I read the, the theme guide, as I'm reading the theme guide, I see Jungian psychology everywhere in the theme guide. So in other words, what less through his prodigious scholarship in Sanskrit, editorial and writing ability, has pulled out of the Gita and put it in English for the rest of us to look at, I say, oh my God, this is the main themes of Jungian psychology. I mean, maybe not, maybe not all the details, but this is, this is really it. You know, I'm amazed by that fact. That's why I wanted to have this opportunity to talk about this, because this is an ongoing, numinous experience for me, where, first of all, I call up Kushbu. I get this idea that we should read the Gita so that others can hear it. And on Mother's Day, Kushbu says, my mother's name is Gita, I have to do this with you. Then we go on and in, up to and including literally meeting Les on May 14th. That's way, to me, the way I look at Jungian psychology, that's way beyond a coincidence, okay? <laughs> and that's definitely a synchronicity of serious Jungian proportions. So... I also wanted to mention that 
as we were reading the other day, and this I hadn't mentioned to Les, and he may not agree, I don't know, but I realized, I had this insight that the story of the Bhagavad Gita is very close in terms of what it does. It's not in words, obviously. And keep in mind, as I'm saying what I'm saying, that human civilization is, a lot of people say, I mean, I, I watch the universe program often, and they say, well, human civilization started about 6,000 years ago. I'm skeptical about that, and here's why. Because there uh, is an old uh, Cherokee legend, and this is where you come in, Miles, because this is going to interest you, I think. I've talked about this before. The old Cherokee legend is that a grandfather is out with his grandson one day, and he tells his grandson a story. And the story is, is this. The grandfather says to the boy, two wolves live inside me. And let me share my screen now so that you have what I have here. He says, a fight is going on inside of me. It's a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil. It's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, and self-pity. And then the other wolf, the other wolf is, whoops, I think I missed the other wolf, just a moment. Okay, so the other wolf is good. He's joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And so what had come to my mind as I was envisioning the scene with Arjuna and Krishna is that the two armies that are there, since I see, see it as a psychic event, as Dr. Jung, I think, would, I think there's an argument within the Indian culture about whether the, the battle between the Kauravas and the Pandavas ever actually occurred. Some, some towns in India claim that it, they, those battles occurred in, in their place, but the timing of those battles is broadly debated going back as much as 5,000 years, and as I understand, as much as 5,000 years, and as I understand it, the Gita itself was not written down until uh, between 200 BC and 200 AD in the Christian era, so in that 400-year span. So in other words, if it did occur 5,000 years ago, it was passed along by oral tradition for at least 5,000 or 3,000 years before it was even written down. And so what that got me thinking about is the story of the old Cherokee legend. And to me, and, and Kushbu confirmed what, what I thought about it, which is I see these two armies as two sets of complexes that we face in our life that all of us have to face. And we have to choose between the two sets of instincts and impulses and so on that we have. And Dr. Jung all, all very often referred to First John 4, 1, which it says, examine the spirits, whether they be from God or not. And so I see these two armies as complexes or instincts or impulses, which all of us face, and we have to decide between the two. And so the idea of Arjuna and Krishna being between these two armies is why it brought to mind this Cherokee legend. So I'm not saying that the Cherokee legend is descended directly from the Bhagavad Gita, not at all. But what I'm saying is that 
the kernel of the story, the archetypal kernel of the story, probably originated the same because as we know now, Columbus was right. He had <laughs> he had run into Indians in when he landed in North America. He was wasn't right about it, the geography, but it's now been demonstrated and going back now almost 200 years that major tribes of Native Americans are actually descended from Indians. And specifically the, the example that immediately comes to mind is uh, Daniel Borston's book, The Discoverers. Daniel Borston was the Librarian of Congress and so a very scholarly person in his own right. And he tells the story in The Discoverers of a, of a diplomat who wanted to try to prove a link between Native Americans and the Iroquois Nation, which is the six tribes in Northern New York State, which Miles is quite familiar with. And so this diplomat in 1840 decided that he couldn't do it by language because language changes too fast. So, but he thought he could do it by structure of the community, community structure. So what he did was he created a, a diagram of the structure of the Iroquois nation and he sent it to 200 foreign service stations around the world. And what he got back was one that said, this is exactly the same as the Tamils in Sri Lanka, then Ceylon. And so obviously the Tamils are from the Madras Chennai area of India because Tamil Nadu, which is the state in India in which they live, the capital is Chennai, and it means place of the Tamils, but the Sri Lankans also are Tamils. And um, so the diplomat in Ceylon, then Ceylon, said this is exactly the same uh, tribal structure as the, as the Tamils. And so that was largely established, and I think nowadays we can probably prove it by DNA, if, if nothing else. But going back as far as 1840, we were already understanding that. So, but why is that significant? It's significant because the Bering land bridge over which these tribes passed between Asia and North America has been gone for 11, for 11,700 years. It disappeared 11,700 years ago. So it means that the kernel of this story had to come to North America before that time. And because it took time for people to m migrate from Southern India up to um, what is basically Siberia and make this transit, it must have been, the story must have had its kernel maybe as much as 15,000 years ago and, and probably more. And so these were stories that had been passed down. Now, I'm fully aware that what I've just said is probably a thousand PhD theses <laughs> possibilities. I've only scratched the surface of what the possibilities are here in terms of what this could mean for understanding both ourselves as a species, but religion in general. But uh, Miles is very interested in Native American uh, religions. We often find correspondences between Native American traditions and Indian psychology, basically. And so it's, it's, just an observation at a, at a very basic and rudimentary level, but I don't know where this is all going. Obviously, one of my motivations has been um, 
to reduce the amount by which human beings use religion as a weapon. Okay, basically. All right, that's been one of my fundamental objectives for a long while. Jung um, made the observation, and here's a quote of his that I love that is right down the middle for me. Uh, and this is found in volume 10 of the collected works of C.G. Jung, which is entitled Civilization in Transition. And this is, this is from a book of quotes that were pulled together by some of his closest disciples. And this is in a chapter called The Way to God. But this one quote is, is the essence of it. For thousands of years, the mind of man has worried about the sick soul, perhaps even earlier than it did about the sick body. The propitiation of gods, the perils of the soul, and its salvation, these are not yesterday's problems. Religions are psychotherapeutic systems in the truest sense of the word and on the grandest scale. They express the whole range of psychic problem in mighty images. They are the avowal and recognition of the soul and at the same time, the revelation of the soul's nature. From this universal foundation, no human soul is cut off. Only the individual consciousness that has lost its connection with the psychic totality remains caught in the illusion that the soul is a small circumscribed area, a fit subject for scientific theorizing. The loss of this great relationship is the prime evil of neurosis. And that's from an essay entitled The State of Psychotherapy Today, and it's paragraph 367 of volume 10 of the collected works of C.G. Young. That's sort of the thrust of where I've been coming th mm -hmm. from in, in my study of C.G. Young from the beginning, more or less, is how can we get civilizations around the world to, to stop fighting with them one another over religion and start to see their commonality. And I know that there are priests, rabbis, pastors, mm -hmm. mullahs, and others in the United States who do get together from time to time, but there's no evidence that they that they try to bring commonalities into their congregations. I, I haven't found any evidence of that. 